don't suppose anybody who's here can see very much at the moment. It's a bit dark out there. As I think you can't see. Is that right? Oh dear, three minutes past six. That's no good. Oops. Oi, oi, oi. status. There is also a recruitment drive on to attract new, younger officers to the prison service, particularly from within the Catholic community, and dissidents are keen to frighten young Catholics out of signing up. The overall capability of dissident groups to mount attacks in Great Britain was recently downgraded, and the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Theresa Villiers, said yesterday that their sophistication and potency had been reduced. There has been a realignment of some formerly disparate factions in recent months, which has brought some disaffected, senior and experienced provisional IRA members into a more coherent group. The Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg has attacked Conservative plans to repatriate powers from Europe as nonsensical. His intervention came a day after the government suffered an embarrassing defeat when more than 50 rebel Conservative MPs joined Labour by voting for a real terms cut in the next EU budget. The Chancellor George Osborne has been attempting to reassure Tory Eurosceptics about the issue, but Mr Clegg said there was no prospect of securing a budget cut. Our Deputy Mr Clegg Mr. should James shut Hanley up! Reports. Last night the government was defeated, today it tried to pick itself up. The Chancellor, George Osborne, said he understood the frustrations of the 53 Conservative MPs who had rebelled, demanding that the EU's long-term budget be cut and just frozen. The government would listen, Mr Osborne said, and he pointedly refused to say a cut was unrealistic. When the Labour Party was in charge, they allowed big increases in the EU budget. We have made it clear that is completely unacceptable. We will not accept a deal unless it is good for the British taxpayer. We will veto any deal that is not good for the British taxpayer. We will only put to the House of the Commons a deal that is good for the British taxpayer. But from the Deputy Prime Minister, there was no such comfort. Nick Clegg said the government was seeking just to freeze the EU budget. There was absolutely no prospect, he said, of securing a real terms cut. And he opened up the new front, attacking David Cameron's plans to try to repatriate social employment and other laws back from Brussels. Many who seek this, he said, want to leave the EU altogether. The grand unilateral repatriation of powers might sound appealing, but in reality, is a false promise wrapped in a union jack. This idea that we should or could extract ourselves from the bulk of EU obligations is nonsensical. So just at the moment when David Cameron has been attacked by his own side for not going hard enough on Europe, his coalition partner says he's going too far. You can't wait, can you?
stuck between a rock and a hard place. Mr. Clegg held different views in Europe. What is new is Mr. Clegg's willingness to shout it from the rooftops as we enter the second half of this parliament. European Union leaders will gather in Brussels in three weeks' time to discuss a proposal from the European mm, Commission to increases. increase the EU budget for 2014 to 2020 by 5%. Our Europe editor Gavin Hewitt considers the prospects of reaching an agreement. In seeking to rein in the EU budget, Britain will have an allies. At least seven major states, including Germany, are unhappy with the 5% increase suggested by the European Commission. They want strict limits on EU spending at a time of austerity. No other country, however, takes such a hard line as Britain. Yet there are many different agendas. The Swedish say it is unacceptable for the largest part of the budget to go on the common agricultural policy. Exactly. The French, however, are determined to protect farm subsidies and have hinted that they too might use their veto. Denmark has threatened to use its veto unless it gets a rebate. Poland is opposed to slimming the budget because, as a relatively poor country, it benefits from EU grants. So, forging an agreement later in November will EU be EU just doesn't work, full stop. It's been too funded. big, too complicated, there's too many different to agendas in it. it. So, it's a waste of time. Much will turn on talks next week between the German Chancellor... So, the common and market and nothing and else. The UK says it has the toughest negotiating position of any EU state. But if it is to avoid being isolated, it'll have to build alliances, and that involves compromise. Around 6,500 jobs are at risk at the electrical retailer Comet, which is to be placed into administration next week. It's one of the biggest high street dealers to fall into the economic downturn in Woolworths in 2008. Our business correspondent, Jonty Bloom, has the details. Comet was founded in 1934 and has 240 stores, but it's been struggling for years. The electrical and electronics market changes rapidly with many bestsellers from previous years, such as music players, now included as standard on phones or personal computers. Intense competition, especially from the internet, has also squeezed sales and profits in the middle of a tough economic downturn. Dan Wagner, chief executive of the e-commerce business Power Technologies, says Comet has failed to keep up with the opposition. The convenience for consumers of buying on the internet and buying on their mobile devices is changing the way that retailers have to respond to support them. Uh, retailers like Comet fail to take advantage of that consumer shift, and that's why they're in the situation they are in today. Things were so bad at Comet earlier this year that its owners, in effect, paid a private investment firm £50 million to take the business off their hands. But that company is now about to throw in the towel as suppliers increasingly demand cash up front before they deliver Christmas stock to the struggling chain. 6,500 staff at Comet now face an uncertain future <coughs> and customers are being advised to act quickly to collect their orders before the company goes into administration. Military censors in Israel have allowed the country's best-selling newspaper to publish a detailed story establishing that Israeli commanders assassinated a senior figure in the Palestine Liberation Organization in 1988. Abu Jihad was shot in a Seaborn raid on the PLO's headquarters in Tunisia, which was planned by the Mossad spy agency. The newspaper, Yed Yud Ahrenut, is promising a more detailed account of the operation in its next edition.
terms of reference had to be widened for any reason. The Pollard Review was commissioned by the BBC two weeks ago to examine whether there were any failings in the corporation's management of the Newsnight investigation into Jimmy Savile, including the broadcast of several tribute programmes to the star, and whether any of the programme material could have been of interest to the police. In a blog last month, Newsnight's editor Peter Rippon said he took the decision to drop the investigation for editorial reasons with no pressure from senior management. But this account was challenged by two Newsnight journalists on a BBC Panorama programme. The corporation has since corrected the blog and Mr Rippon has stepped aside from the programme. He has not spoken publicly and will give his account to the Pollard Review. You're listening to the Six O'Clock News on BBC Radio 4, the main news so far. For the first time in nearly 20 years, terrorists have murdered a prison officer in Northern Ireland. The Deputy Prime Minister, Nick Clegg, has said there is absolutely no prospect of Britain securing a cut in the European Union budget. Still to come, the stuffed snake that's costing the Foreign Office £500 a foot. What? <laughs> Campaigning for the US presidential election has resumed after its suspension for Hurricane Sandy, which wreaked havoc along America's eastern seaboard. Around 4.5 million people are still without power, and the latest estimate puts the bill for the damage at around £31 billion. Pounds. More than 80 people have been killed. Many areas remain underwater. 20,000 people in the city of Hoboken and in New Jersey are still stranded as floodwater contaminated with sewage surrounds their homes. Our correspondent, Michelle Fleury, sent this report. In Hoboken, New Jersey, the state hardest hit by the storm, rescue vehicles motored through streets turned into rivers. Some thousand people are trapped in their homes because of floodwater contaminated by sewage. Latifa Crandall and her sick baby are the lucky ones, plucked to safety by the National Guard. They was around here, picking somebody else up, and I just rushed like, excuse me, I need help too, I need to go to the hospital, and they just screwed me up. And for some, life after Sandy will never be the same again. Marsha Fickwitz's son, Jacob Vogelman, is among at least 76 who've lost their lives. I kept calling every 10 minutes, and then finally a man answered his phone, and I said, where's my son? I'm Detective Simon, and I said, where's my son? And I kept saying, please just tell me if my son is alive. Even those spared from the worst of Hurricane Sandy face many inconveniences. Fuel shortages are now starting to develop. I'm standing at a petrol station on 10th Avenue and West 36th Street in Manhattan, and even though the pumps are no longer working, cars are still pulling in here. How many places have you tried to find petrol? About 10. About 10? Yes. Between New Jersey and Manhattan, about 10 places. With parts of the subway reopened and three major airports back in operation, New York is doing its best to stay open for business. And it's back to the campaign trail for President Obama and Mitt Romney. The president had taken time out to deal with the aftermath of Sandy, saying there were no Democrats or Republicans at times like that, just fellow Americans. At least seven people are now known to have died in a cyclone that's hit the southeastern coast of India with strong winds and torrential rain. More than 100,000 people were moved from their homes in low-lying areas of Chennai before the cyclone arrived. Police searching for a missing vet in North Wales say they've found human remains in a field in Flintshire. Catherine Going was last seen leaving a supermarket nearly three weeks ago. A man has been charged with her murder. Here's our Wales correspondent, Hull Griffith. North Wales police emphasise that what they've discovered is not a complete body of human remains. Medical and forensic examinations need to take place before officers can confirm <coughs> whether or not they belong to Catherine Going. The remains were found in the shallow water near Sealand, about seven miles from her home. The search shifted there yesterday, following new information from the member of the public. The discovery follows a report like examining a disused quarry where his going to put out car was found. The family travelled from Ireland to assist with the police operation.
exercising their right to choose where they're treated. Activists in Syria say 28 government soldiers have been killed in the northwest of the country. Rebels attacked army checkpoints on the main road between this the car in front has a low cities, tire Damascus on the left. And Aleppo. Five rebels also Not died. Nice chance of telling him though. Regime jets and helicopters have been carrying out more airstrikes in suburbs of the capital and many other places. Jim Muir has been following events from Beirut. Activist groups said rebel fighters overran at least one of the checkpoints near Sarakab, southwest of Aleppo, killing a large number of troops and seizing quantities of arms and ammunition. The checkpoints they attacked controlled the main highway which runs between the two biggest cities, so they're of considerable strategic importance. But the rebels are unlikely to try to hold them. They're exposed positions and government forces are sure to hit back with artillery and air strikes. In fact, opposition gains on the ground at Seraka and at nearby Marat and Alman and elsewhere are believed to be one of the main reasons for the sharp escalation in recent days of the regime's use of its monopoly of air power. Military jets and helicopters are reported to have been in action once again in the eastern suburbs of Damascus and many other locations, often dropping barrels of TNT, which are highly inaccurate but cause huge damage and heavy casualties. In Saudi Arabia, at least 22 people have been killed after a fuel tanker crashed into a bridge in the capital, Riyadh. Officials say the accident caused a gas leak and an explosion which destroyed a warehouse and badly damaged buildings. More than 100 people were injured. The authorities in America are planning to fine Barclays Bank £291 million for trying to manipulate the electricity market in California. The penalty comes four months after the bank was fined by US and British regulators for attempting to rig the LIBOR interbank lending rate. The Lloyds Banking Group has announced that it set aside an extra £1 billion to cover the cost of compensating customers for missold payment.
is seen as a crucial test for Greece's press freedom. Kostas Vaxivanis argues that by printing a list of over 2,000 Greeks sent to hold Swiss bank accounts, he is uncovering suspected tax evasion. The government says it's a breach of privacy. But in court today, Mr. Vaxivanis' lawyers called the charges outrageous and invalid, one journalist union labelling them an absurd farce. Speaking to the BBC before the trial, Mr. Vaxivanis said he is not the one who should be in prison and so accused people with ministers of protecting the powerful. The government threw it in the toilet. It's not just ridiculous. Now, it's like a cartoon. It my signal rate is dropping now in the centre of Manchester, where they've got the 4G going. I'm just wondering if they've pinched some of my bandwidth for the 4G. Tax evasion and corruption run to the top of Greek society. If Kostas Vaxivanis is found guilty, he could be sentenced to up to five years. But whatever the outcome, this will long be considered a landmark case for Greek democracy. A retired British businessman extradited to the United States on arms dealing charges has pleaded guilty at a court in Texas. Christopher Tappin, who's 65 and from Orpington in southeast London, had originally denied the charges, but has done a deal with prosecutors so he can return to the United Kingdom. A spokesman for the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, has denied that a recent flight he made in a motorized hang glider to accompany migrating cranes aggravated an old injury. Recent television footage showed Mr. Putin limping, and the Kremlin has confirmed that he has pulled a back muscle, but it said his work was not affected, although he's rarely left his official residence in recent weeks, and has postponed a number of foreign trips. Scrabble lovers could soon be racking up large scores with such words as quasi, zalpig, and splorder, which are among a selection of English regional terms being considered for inclusion in the board game's official dictionary. This building in front of us, by the way, you're looking at a, at a picture, but you're not looking at the actual building. Finding out what some of the words mean and how they're being received. Scrabble players have more than 150,000. That's not the actual building you were seeing there. It's a painting. Or a picture of some kind. Perry, chair of the Association of British Scrabble Players. I think the the ones with high scoring letters in there, and that's like quasi. I love Zalpik. Quasi scores highly because it has both a Q and a Z. It's from Devon and means unwell. Zalpik is a Devonshire woodlouse. Oh, Queasy is the same, isn't it? Lincolnshire means to walk or run awkwardly. Then there's Meemaw from Lancashire, Henting or grotesque action. Pogger from Kent, a convulsive warrior. Darak from Cumbria, a day's work. The publishers, Collins, have decided to include two dozen dialect words in the next edition of their Scrabble dictionary to help keep them alive. How do you mean leaving? Albert the Anaconda, as civil servants I don't get you. has been on display since the 19th century. He's as long as a cargo container, and he was last repaired about 40 years ago. From Westminster, Chris Mason reports. Albert is thought to have been a gift to the colonial secretary of what is now Guyana in South America in the 19th century. He's been at the Foreign Office, where he's suspended from the ceiling for at least 120 years. Here's an extract from the document about Albert, released by Foreign Office officials under the Freedom of Information Act. As a gift to the Foreign Commonwealth Office, Albert is therefore regarded as an FCO asset. As such, the FCO is obliged to maintain its assets, and the work on Albert was essential maintenance. In moving him from his suspended position in the Ansel Library to facilitate planned refurbishment, it was observed he was in poor condition. A decision was taken to use this opportunity to carry out a refurbishment to Albert. The makeover for Albert, who is 20 feet long, was conducted by...
by a specialist conservation team from the Natural History Museum. His private health care, which took five weeks, didn't come cheap. It cost £10,000 or £500 a foot and even featured an X-ray CT scan. The Foreign Office acknowledged this was a costly procedure that required extensive data processing and a specialist to do the analysis. <laughs> Albert is one of many well-loved heritage specimens cared for by us. <laughs> oh the dear. from the Natural History Museum told the BBC, That's funny. pointing out they also tended to the late Guy the Gorilla for many years, London Zoo's most famous resident. The headlines again. A prison officer in Northern Ireland has been murdered by gunmen who opened fire on him as he drove to work. Unionist and Republican politicians have condemned the attack, which has been blamed on dissident Republicans. <coughs> the